This is Keys to the Shop, episode 372, a milk steaming masterclass with Martin Munchau and Emily Bryant. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFurio. I am your host for the show. Really excited to have you as a listener. Welcome. Um, And if you haven't subscribed to the show, I would really encourage you to hit that button. And that way you'll be always updated when there are new episodes that come out and uh, really helps the show too. And it gives me an idea of, you know, who's listening to this show and, you know, how big is this show? Who, Who does it reach? You know, subscribing is the really the lifeline for podcasters. It would help so much. And also, uh, if you would share these episodes on your social media platforms, share the show with your friends, your boss, your coworkers, your team, uh, that is another great way to spread the love of Keys to the Shop. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Keys to the Shop Consulting. I love being able to help people through the podcast um, by presenting great information, best practices, diving into topics, and and really trying to find solutions for the ups and downs and challenges of running a great coffee shop. And that is exactly what I love about Keys to the Shop Consulting. With Keys to the Shop Consulting, I get to work directly with you to help you assess and improve your operations, your people, your quality, and give you clarity that will allow you to find peace of mind and profitability in running a great coffee shop. And whether that means we work together through remote coaching calls and consultation, or I get to uh, go to your coffee shop and help assess your current operation and then work with you to build things to a higher standard of excellence, there's a lot of ways that we can work together. uh, And I would love to talk with you about that. So all you need to do is reach out to chris at keystotheshop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keystotheshop.com. We'll set up a free discovery call and talk all about how Keys to the Shop Consulting can help you. Again, that email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, speaking of taking things to the next level, I am in love with the brewer known as the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer. This is made by the fine folks over at Voga Coffee and their SCA award-winning technology in the Ground Control Brewer gives you the ability to extract an incredible range of flavors that traditional batch brewing just cannot touch. And it's so repeatable and exact. It's just like getting to know your coffee all over again. It takes your quality to another level. And it's not only a game-changing batch brewer, but the ground control can also make tea, batch diced lattes, batch cold brew. The extraction capabilities of this machine and how people are using it is incredible. So it increases your productivity, profitability, and workflow, as well as improving your quality. So go check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee to learn more about this amazing piece of equipment. And truly, if you're looking for a tool to use in your business that will help your coffee shine in its best light, I definitely recommend getting a Ground Control Cyclops Brewer in your store. Again, to find out more information, go visit them over at groundcontrol.coffee. The process of creation in the coffee shop is one of the most important parts of what we do. And putting together a drink based on an order is, you know, it's it's a small thing, but it's very meaningful. Over time, people begin to trust us, especially if there's consistency with the kinds of drinks that we're putting out. And when we're making plant-based drinks, you have to choose something that's going to perform on bar to achieve that consistency and that quality. And that's why I love the Barista Series from Pacific. The Barista Series is the line of plant-based performance beverages that are created for baristas and approved by baristas all over the world. That's why you're going to find it on some of the world's best coffee bars because it stands up to the heat from steaming creates amazing silky texture and is balanced so that the star of the drink is always the coffee. Uh, Customers love this product. I think you will too. Go visit them over at pacificfoodservice.com to get samples and try it for yourself. They have an extensive lineup that you can choose from. I think you're truly going to be impressed with the barista series. And if you're really looking to serve your customers the most consistent and the best product available, then I think for plant-based drinks, you can't go wrong with the Barista Series from Pacific. 
Okay, everyone. Well, today I'm excited to present to you the first in kind of a series, I guess, of episodes, just two. Um, this is one episode, and it's a bit longer because we are uh, covering milk, and I have two interviews that we've done, one with Morton Munchau and another with Emily Bryant. Morton will be covering milk science, and Emily uh, will be covering the steaming process and helpful tips on physically how to go about creating great textured and steamed milk. Morton Munchau is the founder of Coffee Mind, which is a coffee roasting academy research and consultancy company based in Denmark. And Morton is a scholar of biology who through over 10 years of intense practical and scientific research and application has gained unique insights that have pushed specialty coffee uh, forward. And he is a sought after speaker and presenter having published several papers in scientific journals. And oh, a while back in the early 2000s, one of the things that Morton was doing a lot was presenting on the science of milk. And I remember him doing this and watching his um, presentations online that he gave during the Nordic Cup events back in the day. And so I thought it would be perfect as we've had Morton on the show before on uh, Rate of Rise number five, when we're talking about time and color and roasting, to bring him back to talk about this subject of milk science. Now, following that interview with Morton, we're going to be talking with Emily Bryant, who is a coffee educator with Counterculture Coffee in New York City. She has a long history as an award-winning barista, educator, media personality in coffee, and Coffee Fest World Latte Art Championship Open champion. And I've always been impressed by Emily's ability to break down the subject of uh, anything, and especially with milk and steaming uh, and latte art, in, in a way that really helps people grasp it. Uh, in a simple but profound kind of way where you can gain success a lot quicker. And so that's a sign of a great educator and somebody who has the uh, chops to absolutely back it up. Uh, Emily is one of the greats. And so I'm excited to have both of these fine professionals on the show to talk about milk and the, the science and the steaming. So you'll hear first Morton and then Emily, and then I'll come back to visit with you after we get through. So get ready to dive into the subject of milk with Morton Munchau and Emily Bryant. Okay, Martin, welcome back to Keys to the Shop. It's good to be talking to you face to face this time. Yeah, <laughs> for a change. <laughs> exactly. So uh, you're coming to us from your beautiful roastery and facility there. And I'm really excited to talk to you about something that you've got a lot of notoriety for. Back in the day, uh, you were giving a lot of talks around milk yeah. science. The first one in 2004 at Nordic Barista Cup. That's a long time ago, almost 20 years. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, quite a long time. So we're bringing it back for this conversation today because we need to know what's going on in the pitcher and in the cup. So let's start out with what might be an unfair question, maybe too general, but what are the main components of chemistry of milk that baristas themselves need to be aware of to do a good job in steaming milk? You know, because we have the steps to make great milk and we've been trained to do so just doing the work. But, you know, sometimes we're a little light on the science and understanding of what's happening there. So just talk to us a little bit on the ground level of what we need to be aware of uh, that's happening as we're steaming milk. Well, uh, the first component is the remaining bacteria after a pasteurization where you still have, you kill 99%, which sounds amazing, right? <laughs> You're almost there. But the, the, the remaining 1% will give you a problem within a few weeks, um, in, even uh, uh, in a fridge. Um, and uh, so that's the first thing. In order to get 100% killed, uh, you would have to, um, uh, to uh, heat it much more. So a pasteurization is uh, you heat the milk um, to 72 degrees Celsius. People have to kind of <laughs> do that calculation themselves. <laughs> Uh, it's 72 uh, degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. That's kind of the upper window of killing as many bacteria as possible without uh, creating this sulfur uh, flavor that happens if you heat it more, which is some sulfur bridges that are uh, breaking and exposed in the milk if you heat it more than that. Um, and so, so first the bacteria and then this upper window 
And the next uh, myth here is that people talk about the uh, the sugars uh, uh, are destroyed, which is not the case at all. You would need to get as far as uh, lacto, uh, yeah, milk sugar, you need uh, 250 degrees or something like that. So nothing happens to the sugars they are all right right <laughs> um so so it it's um so first the bacteria we get rid of most of them with pasteurization and the next thing to concern yourself with is the proteins because the proteins are the uh, the surface surface active agents that will help the liquid form a a, a foam um and um, so they are very important in the foam formation, and they are also uh, important in the uh, in the this off flavor that the, this porridge flavor that you get when you heat uh, the milk up too much. And uh, you basically you've got two kinds of proteins in milk. You've got what's called casein, and then you've got the um, uh, the whey proteins. The casein is 80% of the proteins. That's basically the cheese. In milk so when you take out cheese of a milk you've got the whey proteins left and it's the whey pro proteins Th those are some really small globular proteins and they are globular so one protein in is one long strand but it's globular because there are eight sulfur bridges inside that keeps them locked in a globular stiff structure but these uh, sulfur bridges are not very heat stable. So if you heat it more than 72 degrees for 15 seconds, these uh, sulfur bridges will slowly break. And then eventually this sulfur, which is a very aromatic active um, uh, uh, atom, will start to create this um, off flavor uh, that is known when you heat up milk too much. So I think kind of recognizing that you've got bacteria that will also make your foam curdle earlier than you can actually taste it being uh, being um, too old or sour. So this is where it's, it's, it's important to have fresh milk because the remaining 1% bacteria starts to cause problems with the foam even before uh, you can taste that it's sour. So I think that, that might be the main components. Well, that's really interesting because you know, I guess all those things are being taken care of in the steaming process typically don't take milk past a certain point because it produces, you know, off flavors or flavors that the customers are absolutely going to notice, you know, but most of the time it, in my experience, I think when we're, you know, bringing a drink that hot, you know, uh, it, it might, it's a, it's a drink that has a lot of flavor in it and it might mask that sulfur smell. Yeah. <laughs> so it'd be really great to hear about, you know, what's happening step by step as you start the steaming process all the way through to the end of the steaming process. Scientifically speaking, what's happening to the milk there? Yeah. So basically what you do is you're adding hot water because steam is only a gas when it's above 100 degrees. So the second that your the steam is hitting the milk that is never above 100, right? It's always uh, typically maximum 70. Then it just collapses to milk, uh, so to, to water. And I've measured that it's a, around 50%, so if uh, around 10%. So if you start with 500 grams of milk, uh, do a standard steaming and measure it afterwards, you've got 550 grams. So you add approximately 10% of water so that's what you do. So when you steam, you add uh, hot water. Um, so that's also the why the, the, the milk is, is heated up. And um, the, the only way you can create foam with a manual steam wand is if you keep it in the surface, uh, the steam wand tip in the surface so that it presses down air into the milk. So it's not the foam doesn't come out of the steam wand. The steam is a means to press down atmospheric air into the milk. And then eventually they will become smaller and smaller as the steam then later uh, in the spinning pros, uh, phase will uh, make these bubbles smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller every time they pass the steam wand. So that, that's, that's, um, I, I've actually the, the slides that I uh, that I'll uh, pick from uh, here. Is, I did a three-hour milk chemistry e-learning course six years ago, and it's just sitting on my <laughs> on my um, <clears throat> on my hard drive. So it might be something that I release uh, at some point. 
but here I I steam into a balloon because you if you take a balloon and put it around the steam one with tape and steam into it it becomes big like a balloon but if you keep it closed very quickly it collapses and then you can see all the water condensing uh, in the balloon and in the end it's really just a small balloon with water no gas so this is really a good way of illustrating for baristas that steam is not a, a gas uh, that you can use for anything to create a, a foam because it collapses to water and and uh, it's it's atmospheric air that is pressed down yeah so the the atmospheric air is pushing down onto the, the body of milk and we're using that as a tool and we're then taught to spin the milk while the steaming process is happening so that we can take the bubbles that are introduced uh, in the beginning and then make them smaller, as you mentioned. But then in the heating process, you talk about how the sugars don't disappear from the milk, but we're trying to maximize the sweetness yes. of the milk. And I imagine this is something related to the presence of fat and its ability to add texture and you know, influence per, you know, perception of flavor. And so if we're using, uh, let's say, whole milk for kind of a, a universal standard for this conversation, what's happening in this process of steaming that creates the sweetness that we want from the milk? I'm pretty sure, bear in mind it's 10, 15 years ago that I work with this actively, but nothing really happens to any of the, um, of the, the uh, chemically, nothing really happens because you stay, the, the only thing, the fat globals, they are very, very stable. They don't change. The sugars are certainly not changing at all. Only the proteins are sensitive uh, to heat, and that's why we stay below that window. So I'm pretty sure that it's only temperature. And it is how temperature interacts with your mouth that is, is uh, causing all this. I have another slide that I would like to show you, but I haven't kind of, uh, don't know exactly where it is, but I can tell you, you've got four different temperatures uh, uh, neurons in your in your mouth you've got uh, cold pain you've got you you have cool not pain and then you have warm and then you have heat pain and the uh, the heat pain uh, neuron starts to fire let's say if I remember it, it's pretty close to 50 and then it goes up very steeply so if something becomes more um, more uh, hot than 50 it starts to dominate your uh, the neurological signal so you're just simply not told what's in because you are told to just get away and um, uh, so so this is uh, this is not nothing uh, to do with with the chemistry of the milk it's got simply uh, it, it's your neurologically you are warned and that 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 signal is taking over so you're not told about all the nice uh, aromas either uh, my colleague she, uh, she did her master's thesis about serving temperature in coffee, uh, and that's even uh, published in Food Chemistry. So she is a temperature geek. Uh, so that's where I have all this uh, information from. I I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the scientific correct uh, explanation. And that's really interesting to me because I feel like it's a myth that we maximize the sugars by changing something in the milk. And I think I still have this you know, perception that we're, we're bringing these things out like something is physically happening to the milk that makes it sweeter. And so the explanation is, you know, to my mind, like melted ice cream that is te technically not sweeter, but, you know, because of a lower temperature is more available to our palates. Exactly. Exactly. That's the, mm. that's the other extreme, right? That's the, uh, the cold pain receptor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. But how does fat factor into that? Because, you know, when I eat a chocolate bar that has um, a chili a spice in it, the chili spice is not as prevalent in the beginning of, you know, eating it as it is at the end where the, the you know, the chocolate and the, uh, I imagine the fat of the chocolate rescinds off my palate and makes that spice available to me. So is there a masking process that fat adds to this uh, experience? I mean, how does fat impact the perception of flavor and our experience of, of milk and sweetness? Not with sweetness, because fat and sweetness, that, that's the basic taste. Uh, fat inhibits flavor release, so you can have some aromas would be caught in the, in the liquid and not kind of evaporate and give you a signal uh, retronasally. 
if that sweetener sweetness or not this is the thing is it's 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 very very complicated to relate uh, sensory data to chemical data and we've just seen this so much um so sweetness is not necessarily sugars and we saw that in the development time uh, modulation experiment where we saw a very clear um uh, tendency for sweetness to go up for a shorter development time in, in, in roasting. And and so that was a very clear sensory uh, difference um, for uh, for uh, de different development time. But the sugars was below sensory threshold and didn't change. So it was an aroma. So I would I would actually start looking for sweet aromas and those might be uh, inhibited in release from the fat because they stick to the fat. So, but this is just my personal theory because I haven't done any studies into this. It's it's surprisingly difficult to relate uh, chemical data to sensory data, and very often there's not a direct relationship. We've seen this in the research we've done with development time modulation, where we rose. Uh, copies uh, exactly the same, except that they'll have a different development time and ending at the same color. And we can see that uh, the shorter development time you have, the higher the sweetness, and the longer development time you have, the lower the sweetness. But when we looked at the chemical data, the sugars were all below sensory threshold and didn't change. So it was an aroma that caused this um, change in. Uh, in sweetness and uh, fat is uh, is uh, kind of some aromas are sticking to the fat so they're not released retronasally uh, and it might be and this is not something I know because I haven't researched into this but it might be that some sweet aromas are uh, captured or uh, caught by the by the fat but but then again fat might also taste sweet so I'm I'm sorry it's uh, it's very complicated uh, but also acidity for example we all, we've also found that there's not even a relationship between the total uh, level of acidity uh, and perceived acidity brazilian coffee has typically double as much uh, acidity than than kenyans uh, in in uh, we've measured now three different kenyans and three different brazilians pulp natural and they have much uh, brazilians has much higher uh, double the amount of citric acid, for example, but it's perceived much less. So, so often, if if milk is perceived sweet or not sweet at different temperatures or in different circumstances, it's 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 rarely the sugars. And for example, for 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 milk foam, I would I, I would speculate more that it's the temperature, as I mentioned already in itself, um, but also. Uh, the the creaminess, for example, um, uh, the smaller the bubbles, the more creamy. So it's things like that that can both kind of trigger ideas of uh, sweetness. Um, um, yeah. So I guess I guess that's as close I can get to a, an explanation. Right. I, I feel like there's a correlation between what you're talking about and uh, alternative sweeteners, like say stevia and things that aren't technically a sugar, but there's still a perception of sweetness. And, you know, I personally tend not to eat refined sugar if I can help it, but I've read yeah. that your body will produce just as much insulin in the presence of something that has the perception of sweetness because it recognizes it and then it, it fits into that slot. So there's some uh, psychosomatic stuff happening here, it seems like, when it comes to the perception of, of uh, flavors in our experience with milk, yeah, yeah, and, and this is where I'm always very reluctant to to uh, to kind of claim any uh, kind of easy uh, relationship between uh, chemistry and, and sensory. And this is where uh, you really need sensory data and chemical data. You need both of them because the sensory data without the chemist chemical data is difficult to explain. It's just you know you can just see this is what happens to the sensory, but you can't explain it. And uh, if you only have the chemical data, you don't understand the relevance. So if you have both, you understand the relevance of the mod modulation you did, and you can explain it uh, with the chemistry. So that's that's why I really need both. And this is where our research in coffee roasting is the first ever to uh, to make that mapping. Um, so that that's a very important uh, 
step in in making science relevant for the coffee community because if you don't have the sensory data why would you care right <laughs> <laughs> exactly I, I feel like that's all where it's pretty relevant to you as a retailer and so uh, you know now that we're talking about fat let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that we have options for customers in our stores that are varying levels of fat you know you've got skim two percent uh, whole milk and all of the different subcategories of different percentages of fat in milk respond to steaming differently. And of course it also tastes different. And so what's the difference between a skim or low percentage fat milk? And is it really just the difference between the fat that causes this uh, difference in uh, flavor and performance? Well, um, fat is, uh, just tastes nice in itself. It just does. Um, so, so that's a very kind of strong um, kind of cause driving the liking of milk-based drinks. So that's just a sensory kind of fact. Uh, fat also uh, stabilizes a foam. So uh, basically, we we foamed fifteen different types of milk in combinations, and each milk was a combination of a certain protein percentage and fat percentage. So we could systematically see how fat and protein in itself affects uh, different aspects of the foam. Um, and what we saw with um, in, the, in the data was that the higher the fat, um, the lower the percentage of drainage. The more fat you have, the more the drainage is inhibited because fat mo a molecule, a fat globules, a fat molecule is relatively small. But in milk, these uh, fat molecules are captured in big globules. Big, it's almost like a small bacteria. So it's got a, a cell wall surrounding it where there's just a lot of fat molecules inside. So you have to think of a foam. Uh, in a foam, you have a lot of bubbles. And between these bubbles, you have water because around 85% of milk is water, and you've got the proteins and the sugars, they are so small, but the fat globules are, uh, globules are really big. But you have to think about between the bubbles, these will be small uh, corks that will inhibit the drainage. So it inhibits the drainage speed, so it makes a more stable foam, but fat, fat molecules in itself inhibits foam formation. Think of if you try to make an, an egg white foam. An egg white foam is a protein foam, uh, just like milk. But if you just have the smallest amount of yolk, which is a fat, you can't make it egg white foam because fat inhibits protein foam formation. So you will always have a, a bit of fat uh, kind of escaping these globules, and that would inhibit the foam formation when you steam it. But once it's foamed, it's more stable because now the fat is is uh, acting like small corks uh, between the bubbles, so so that's kind of the how uh, fat affects the the steaming. Oh yeah, that makes sense, and I guess this is why we have such a hard time when we are steaming really high fat milks for customers who really want fat, and sometimes things up to even heavy cream. And of course, that's you know a very big challenge and it's even the sound of it is just kind of like <laughs> sounds like yeah. actual curdling is happening you know because the 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 fat from the milk is is holding you back from forming foam and the perceived sweetness is just that the fat tastes good and i imagine the sugar difference between the the half and half or high fat milk and the skim might be slightly similar or kind of similar it's it's almost similar, and that has got to do with some calculations I also do in the uh, in the e-learning. Um, uh, basically, when you take fat out, you take a volume out, so all of the remaining ingredients makes up a higher percentage of the total because something is taken out. So nothing is added, but you'll have a bit more sugar because the total is smaller now that fat was removed. So that's why you will see a bit higher percentages of protein and, and sugar in, uh, in skim milk. Not because anything is added, because but a fraction is removed and then the remaining um, is a bigger percentage uh, compared to the water that's also in it. So it's pretty, the, the kind of the, 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 the easy, correct answer is that it's the same. Interesting. So when we're talking about the foam itself, 
we have dry foam and then we have wet foam and you know i prefer you know dense foam i don't prefer dry foam to me it feels like you know of course you're getting less flavor per you know square inch i guess of uh, on your palate than you are uh, with a denser milk you know what's the correlation between the different densities and the different intensities of flavor you know what's going on there between the different foam types that we have to prepare on the bar i think it's, it has to do with your mouth feel it just tastes creamier so one of the things your example with the melted ice is it's not only because it might be that you have a warning signal from the cold pain receptor but the creaminess when it just melts is is uh, is just um, uh, very pleasant and i think that's that's uh, that's that's the same with uh, high fat milk uh, well no sorry with wet foam that was your point so wet foam uh, you have liquid between the bubbles and that just gives you a a, a different heaviness and different mouth feel so um, if you have um, if you have liquid between the bubbles and the bubbles are very small then it is then you have the maximum creaminess and then when when the foam ages it ages by gravity pulling the the water between the bubbles so in the beginning the bubbles are uh, completely spherical and has a distance because there's uh, water between them but as gravity pulls water it's, it starts to drain and eventually the bubbles will start to touch each other and then there's still water um, between and then they'll start to lose their round shape and then they'll become this uh, soapy uh, water foam uh, that is just has no heaviness because there's no liquid there's only foam um, films and no liquid between them and then there's no creaminess so that's kind of the 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 uh, the, the age um, or the lifespan or the life stages of a foam going from maximum wet to completely dry in different stages and this is where it's interesting that high fat you get less foam but it's more stable and uh, less fat full, uh, skim milk you have get a lot of foam but it, it really drains very quickly. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, after this episode um, airs, uh, we're going to be coming out with one uh, similar on alternative milks, on plant-based beverages, where there's the addition of fat to these various sources that make up these um, plant-based milks. And of course, that's an essential ingredient because it provides the stability that you need to make those beverages work. Interesting. We my measurement method has been standing in the basement at the university for i don't know 10 years and last year two students uh, contacted me to to start uh, to to test uh, plant-based milk so we have some data that we are still uh, calculating now because we wanted to compare all the different types of plant-based milk we could find up against normal milk and barista milks and and see how they performed so uh, that that's really an interesting subject but we're not done with the, uh, the data analysis yet. Well, that's exciting. I can't wait to see that. So one of my last questions here is around the uh, competition milk that we see all over the place, and that's the freeze distilled milk that we see so many uh, champion baristas using. And so I, I believe the method is that you um, freeze a gallon of whole milk, I presume, and, and then put it in the refrigerator so that it can... Uh, shed and and melt only the water content of it of of the milk uh, through a filter of some kind where then you have a separation of the higher fat content milk at the top and then the water content is separated from it i mean obviously something is happening that makes this so desirable uh, for competitors really what is going on in this process of freeze distilling milk well, that I actually had to research a bit before this podcast uh, because I didn't know what it was. I've heard about freeze distillation of, of alcohol, so I had an idea, but I just double checked. So in a way, it's almost a bit like filtration in the sense that you are removing something but not other things from, from a complex substance such as milk. So the, the, the technology of doing this when you're freezing something, so it's something that's called, it's called freezing depression. And we know it from pure water versus salt water. So if you take pure water and uh, and add salt, 
all of a, all of a sudden you'll see that it starts melting. But the weirdest thing, it also drops in temperature. That's weird. But what happens is that if you add salt, the water molecules are not able to to um, to uh, organize themselves in a perfect crystalline structure. Uh, that happens when it when it uh, turns into ice, and when it's not really able to create this perfect crystalline structure, then you need to cool it even more before be, before it really becomes crystalline. So if you add something to a liquid, you are depressing the freezing point because you are disturbing the ability of the liquid to become perfect crystalline structure. So if you take milk and freeze it, and and then put it for for um, uh, put it uh, uh, what's it called when you then uh, melt it right then you will see the areas of the milk that has a higher concentration of non-water will have a freezing depression which means when you're coming with the temperature for, from below let's say you start at minus 20 everything is frozen right but if you then heat it up at, at one point you will get to minus 5 degrees and you will have some areas of the milk that is so saturated with other than water that it will start to melt even at minus five because it, it's this, these are the areas that are freeze point depressed, right? So they'll start to melt before the heavy water saturated areas. So that's why you will have everything else but the water will start to drip first. And then you will end up with a concentrate of everything. And that's why I con compare it to filtration because it's it's basically what we do um, when we make a pour over. We have a complex um, a material such as ground coffee, and then we pour water over, and it's a filtration process because everything that's smaller than the holes in the filter will uh, will will pass, and anything that's uh, bigger than the holes will kind of stay. So this is how you, if you have a French press, for example, it's it's all submerged, it's not filtrated. But if you have a filter below it, you will separate them. And this is what's happening in this freeze distillation. I've invented barista milk here in Denmark, and that was exactly the point that that we we found a filter where the holes are bigger than, of course, water, uh, so that they would they can they will drain through. And what is kind of left behind is the proteins and uh, the fat uh, in a dairy. Fat is removed as the first thing, and then you have the skim uh, fraction. So it's it the holes were uh, only smaller than the proteins, which means that water and and sugar would kind of uh, go through, and then you would have a higher concentration of proteins left behind, which is then a, a milk that has a higher foamability. So in a sense, uh, the milk uh, that I uh, invented had this idea with a fil filtration technique rather than a, a, a freeze distillation. So in fact, it's a low fat milk that's got the ability to steam like a whole milk. Um, yeah, but then then we add the fat later on. <laughs> so it was just technically to kind of uh, uh, make the uh, filtration uh, easier. So you can always add the, uh, the fat later on to a milk that has now a higher protein concentration. Uh, because uh, water and uh, sugars has been drained. It's really fascinating. And, and just like in coffee roasting and you know, other pursuits of making a product better, um, I hope these experiments turn into something that, you know, the common barista and customer can <laughs> yeah. experience as, as well. Yeah, I would say that the idea, and because the research that we did where I showed you the five different fat percentages and three different protein percentages, the protein percentages that we that we um, that we uh, used was uh, three, three point four, and three point eight, which is the natural variation of uh, cows here in Denmark. So we wanted to test if the natural um, variation over the year of proteins will affect the uh, the properties um, of of the the protein foam, and we found out that it did. That we found that. So my idea was that. I don't want to get outside the natural window of normal milk. So the idea was to every day the protein level is measured and then it's filtrated to always uh, uh, go uh, go to the maximum of the natural. So it, it, it just foams as normal milk would do in the best periods. Uh, the research that we that we did 
showed that the natural variation between 3 and 3.8 of protein in milk over the year that depends on the season and also the lactation period, uh, the, the weeks after it got a, a calf, uh, it will change. So the idea was that milk is never better than when natural milk is best, right? But we found out that uh, the foam uh, foamability depended on the protein level. So my idea was to why don't we just fix the uh, the milk so that it always has the percentage when natural milk by coincidence has the highest percentage. So it's not outside the window of normal milk, but it just always captures the uh, the milk at the at its best because every day the protein level is measured and then it's it's uh, filtrated or concentrated up to the highest uh, natural level, which is uh, in our case four percent of protein. So the milk that I invented was not wasn't better than uh, than milk uh, normal milk except it always performed as natural milk did when it was by coincidence best. So it sounds like these these uh, competition milks uh, goes outside that area. But with everything, right? Uh, my filtration method kind of distinguished between proteins and uh, and sugars. Where if you if you make this freeze distillation, I guess that you pretty much just up concentrate every so in the sense you just take a bit of water out of everything so you have more of everything left but i don't know there might be some st stuff that melts earlier and later and stuff I, I but i don't know yeah so here's my last question for you today you know we've been talking about the consistency uh issue and you know that's obviously something that we want to offer our customers customers love consistency especially if we can get you know excellence in consistency that's really great and of course i, I hope we're sourcing our coffee well we're sourcing we're sourcing our ingredients well and when it comes to that you know there's a lot of talk about you know very small dairies and farm direct milks that are smaller batches versus large uh dairies and you know it's more homogenized and you know there's a lot of consistency in homogenized milk and so how do we approach sourcing great milk and getting a great product that also offers us consistency at the same time because what i've seen of course is that you know, again the smaller you know dairies might have a, a harder time producing milk that performs as well on bar and this is going back uh, you know an example would be like the nordic cup a long time ago did this kind of a challenge where baristas had to actually go next door to where the competition was taking place and actually milk a cow and then use that milk in their cappuccinos. That was my uh, the, the first Nordic Barista Cup that I was in at 2004. That was uh, crazy Jens Nørgaard and Martin Hildebrand. Nice. So I was, I was there <laughs> <laughs> milking them. <laughs> And, you know, that was an era where just trying to get single origin everything, you know, single origin milk <laughs> from one cow, uh, just like single origin coffee. But also in competition, a lot of people were falling flat on their faces because literally the milk would just fall flat. You know, it all depended on the diet of the animal and, you know, um, what the composition of that milk was. And so compared to homogenized milk from a larger, you know, a collection of sources, you know, it may have had a better taste, but it didn't perform as well for, for developing foam, etc. So what's going on there? And then again, how can we best source the, the best milk for our cafes? Great question. Uh, so uh, the advantage of the big uh, dairies is that if a cow or a farm delivers something that doesn't work, it's mixed into such a big volume that it doesn't matter. So you get more consistency there. And I've worked with uh, several small um, uh, yeah, farms where one of the problems, uh, people think that there's, uh, well, sometimes I think, I don't know, this, this was 20 years ago, but 20 years ago, every barista would have tried that sometimes the milk just doesn't foam. Seriously, it doesn't foam. It's just like the, the uh, the, the uh, trying to make an egg white uh, foam if you have left some yolk in it. And that's exactly what happens because there's there's something uh, called, yeah, the fatty acids. Uh, so a fat molecule is called, uh, well, it's on a glycerol thing and then you've got three, some fatty acids on it and then you have this huge global, right? So uh, this is really foam killers. So it's very important that these uh, globals are not destroyed, but it can happen if the cow has an infection 
this is the first thing that happens. If the milk is freezed, if the if the pump pressure is too high, uh, in old systems uh, you are more uh, uh, prone to have this. So there there are more t possible reasons of this. Uh, I don't remember them all, but this is just uh, some of them. Uh, and and also there is an enzyme called lipase in milk that is designed to to break down the um, uh, the fat. And this has to be in inactivated as fast as possible. It is, it's inactivated during the uh, pasteurization, and that's why it's important to cool it down quickly and then have it heat treated, because otherwise this can be another cause of free fatty acids. So free fatty acids is something that happens if you have poor hygiene, old high pressure systems, uh, problems with, uh, with areas of freezing in the cooling, so if the stirring is not efficient enough, so there are different uh, uh, possible sources for free fatty acid that just will make your milk not foam. And this is something that more often happen, unfortunately, in the smaller dairies or farms, unless they have avoided all these factors. Of course, they can do that, but it's just I've just um, seen this a bit more often, which doesn't really happen in the big... Uh, but of course, I like the idea better with uh, having small farms and, and just kind of teaching them about this. Uh, it, it should be enough. It, it's things that could be fixed pretty easily if you just know what the factors are. Yeah, so there's just like really large dairies that you can't talk to, and then there's the small dairies that have, they don't have enough production to be able to facilitate your needs. But So, so I guess there's a, a, a midpoint that you have to find in order to, I don't know, you know, have your milk and drink it too. But all that said, you know, communication is always great. And just like, you know, we want to increase our ability to communicate and connect along, along the supply chain. It seems like that would be a great thing with, with dairies as well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we talked about it would be interesting to share information with the small dairies and small farmers about uh, these free fatty acids. And, um, and, um, and Denmark is, a, is pretty big on dairy. So there's a small Danish pamphlet with informing about free fatty acid causes for it and ways to avoid it. So it could be interesting to translate that into English and kind of distribute it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you get an in with your local dairy and, uh, again, have those conversations just like you do with your roaster or with a roaster talks with a farmer and, you know, good conversations and relationships like this will definitely yeah. help us in the end. But this has really been great. Uh, thank you so much, Morton. I, I appreciate you being on the show. You know, obviously there's a lot more to learn about this subject, but you've done such a great job helping us understand these things. So where can we uh, be connected with you and learn more about what you do with Coffee Mind Academy? Well, uh, on our website, coffee-mind.com, um, uh, we have uh, e-learning um, and uh, physical courses, as you can see here with a lot of roasters. But we, we work with roasting and, and centuries. As I mentioned, it's 10, 15, 20 years ago that I worked with this milk. So uh, so so it was really fun to go back and kind of uh, remember all these things. And then on Instagram, Coffee Mind Academy, in one word, um, I think that those are the best places. Well, thank you for taking a walk down memory lane with me here today. <laughs> uh, it was really great to have you on the show again. Thank you. It was great. Take care, Chris. Thanks a lot. Okay, everyone. Well, I hope that you really uh, loved that interview with Morton on the science of milk. Let's get right into our next interview with Emily Bryant about steaming milk and the steps to achieving this very well. Well, Emily, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm excited to have you on the show. And how are you today? Thank you for having me. I, I'm doing great today. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about a common uh, a common thing that we've got uh, in you know the coffee industry which is you know an affinity for steaming milk you know i get to watch you compete a lot and you know we're both competitors i'm an ex competitor and you're actively competing and um you know one of the things that i i really admire about what you've done with your career is not just achieved a lot of um notoriety for skill uh, in, uh, you know, in barista work and latte art, but also in communicating, teaching those things. And so um, that's why we're having you on the show today, because, you know, if we're going to talk to somebody about steaming milk, I think 
you're you're right there. I that the, the person I want to talk to. So um, I guess we should just start by you know talking about the idea of steaming milk to begin with. Um, when you first became a barista, I imagine you, like anybody else, had kind of a rough time getting used to the idea of creating perfect milk. What was what was the first you know foyer? <laughs> what was the first entry into uh, milk steaming for you like, and and how was your uh, learning curve? Oh, it was it was awful. I think like most people, I started off by steaming milk with tons of bubbles uh, and crazy aeration, like way too much aeration. Um, I, I kind of like, I guess, okay, anecdotally, I started off in a small little bakery, and this is a bakery that didn't really teach how to dial in coffee other than how to dial it in by smell, which I think is crazy by now. I'm like, I do use smell, but now I'm like, whoa, they really could have shown me better, huh? Uh, so I kind of had to teach myself a lot in the early days, and it did take quite a long time before I actually learned how to do it. And most of that was because I didn't really have a frame of reference. You know, I think a lot of people don't have a frame of reference for what good milk looks like and, and how to operate it, which is really kind of why I love to teach how to steam milk. I do it like once every month. I teach a different version of how to steam milk on my channels. Uh, I do remember when I first started, I had the opportunity of working on a Seneso Hydra. This is like six years ago or seven years ago. And that machine is very forgiving when you're steaming milk. Like if you over it, it doesn't really affect the milk, at least in my experience, as much, which I think was kind of a detriment to my learning curve because I was learning improper technique on a machine that was super forgiving, right? So if I'm being really honest, it, it took me about a year and a half to fully comprehend how to perfectly steam milk over and over and over again and any, even longer after that to understand like the science of what's going on. Um, but here we are now. <laughs> it's interesting that ease of use of equipment would be one of those obstacles. And, uh, you know, maybe that's a separate conversation about the advance of technology and, and the trade-offs that we have in terms of how much we can learn. The idea here then is um, if we kind of conceptually understand milk, like we can be told in a manual, like step-by-step step how to do it and all that stuff. But, you know, when we're in front of a machine, um, we, oftentimes we have to overcome certain, you know, inhibitions we have towards, you know, hot steam coming out of a machine at pressure and the, the fear that we have to, you know, that makes people make milk too cold or too hot. It's all <laughs> kind of seems based on fear to me, but I mean, as you're teaching, you talked about some hurdles that you had. I mean, what are the hurdles you see other people have uh, as you teach? Why do you think the um, these impediments to learning milk are there in the first place? Totally. I think that a lot of people, it's just like when you see people uh, tap on the portafilter with the tamper, it's, it's kind of like a bad cold. Like once you learn a kind of improper technique, it's really easy to share that across the industry uh, just by being around people. And I think a lot of people, if they have training, are very much potentially having kind of training that almost like I was saying before, you're working on a broken leg, right? Or like you kind of have to climb uphill to relearn what you're doing. And when I teach people, the thing that I see the most struggle with is like you're saying, it's this intimidation and fear that something's going to go wrong. And then they overthink it, they over aerate it. And I always teach people, the first thing I say about milk is less is more. And I find that fundamentally true for a lot of things in coffee, but even more so for milk. Like you want a creamy velvet latte, that's amazing, but you don't actually have to throw a ton of air in there to get that result, right? Like you just need to be very careful and diligent with how the air gets into that milk, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and that intimidation is is something, it's just something that's not used to, uh, you're not used to, um, and that we have a uh, body of uh, resources and instruction to help us get over that is really great. However, it doesn't um, mean that you escape having to uh, kind of confront your own intimidation. You have to go through the oracles if you want to make a never-ending story reference right. here, which I do. Um, <laughs> you just have to face yourself <laughs> and get through it. <laughs> but so why don't we talk about the things, you know, getting right to sort of what you instruct people to do with milk uh, when they're standing in front of the espresso machine. They've got a cold gallon whole milk, let's say, uh, a pitcher, 
and time. So where do you start when you teach a barista good steaming technique? Oh my gosh, my favorite thing to do, and just like we were saying before, a lot of people have a lot of fear when they come up to the steam wand. They find it very intimidating. So I usually try to crack a joke or I make it seem as chill and relaxed as possible. A lot of the time I'll use rhymes. I love rhymes when I teach because it helps people remember. And it also gives them a little bit of levity and lightheartedness. Uh, So usually the first thing I do when I start with steaming milk is I explain you know, scientifically what's going on, depending on the person and how, what level of understanding they want. And for me personally, understanding what's going on helped me a lot when I was actually figuring out how to be as consistent as possible. Uh, so I'll usually open with a little bit of understanding, then I'll show what we're looking for, and then I work through the technique, and I have a series of rhymes that I love to use. The first one is give it a spray into the tray. This is in regarding to getting rid of that condensation that's in the steam wand. <laughs> Uh, And it just happens to rhyme, which is great. Uh, The other one that I love is pull that steam wand out and marry it to the spout like they're in deep, deep love. That is one of my favorites. Um, You can always, if you want to, steam from the side of a pitcher. You can do these weird angles. But in my experience, from what I've done, and I've steamed on hundreds of machines, just pulling the steam wand straight out and using the pitcher to tilt is a much better and more effective, consistent way of getting good milk. Uh, Okay, so that at that point, you're telling people to put the steam uh, wand in the spout, but you're also having them tilt it a little bit as well. And the mechanics of why they're doing this is is what is what is the uh, reason why people are um, tipping their pitcher to the side? I find it easier to get a consistent workflow if you're using the spout and the steam wand because the biggest reason, kind of the biggest thing I see is, again, you can totally steam using the side of a pitcher. Uh, You can just use the angle of the steam wand rather than the angle of the pitcher. But what we want to do when we're steaming milk is be as delicate as possible with the whirlpool effect that's happening in the pitcher. We don't want to disturb that. We don't want any of the steam hole tips to be exposed for any reason when we don't want them to be. So whenever you turn the pitcher and you use the spout and it's pulling against the steam wand, you're kind of locking it in. Like it's, it's just locked into place. So your, your propensity of moving is much less. Your region of error becomes a little more narrower, which is ultimately what we're trying to do to get consistency, right? Right. And there's a lot of play between what happens at the pitcher and what you're doing with your body at that moment. I mean, do you instruct people a little bit about how they're supposed to be standing and the stillness with which they're they're holding the pitcher? Because I, 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 we, we're all kind of a little fidgety on these. And I imagine... Some of that translates into what's happening in the pitcher. We not, might not even realize it. It absolutely translates. Uh, usually what I teach people to do is I always say pinkies out, uh, which just means that I like to use my pinky to stabilize the pitcher against the actual uh, metal of the machine. That way my hand is not moving very much and I'm in control. And when I make movements, say I'm injecting air, I can control them much more tightly I can make micro injections rather than a giant injection because my hand slipped or I was at a weird angle or, you know, these steam wands are usually on some kind of bearing. So they kind of move a little bit. That's the last thing you want. You want to be able to have complete control. And usually like in a competition setting, say you're you're at the grinder, you're at the machine and then you're steaming your milk. I would instruct people to take one step at a time and always be in front of the thing you're doing. Pay attention to what you're doing while you're doing it. Keep that pinky out. And keep things as stable as possible. And I think you'll have a much easier time with consistency. Okay. So now we're talking about micro injections rather than these large bursts of air. And this is this is critical, I guess, because, you know, when we're talking about intimidation, one of the biggest intimidating factors of, of steaming, at least in my experience, has been when the milk actually starts to rotate in the pitcher and now there's no going back, you know. Uh, it, so people... <laughs> start with a little bit of fear and then there's this also now oh we're in it now like i i've got to steer this thing so the big injections of air seem to be more likely because now we're just not even really thinking with our you know prefrontal cortex anymore we're just like completely <laughs> on the amygdala hijack um <laughs> so h- how do we um manage the injection of air amidst all of the chaos of what's going on Totally. It, it is chaotic. It is super fast. It's going to happen really quick unless you're working on something like a Breville, which takes a little longer. Uh, usually what I do is that combination of using your pinky and trying to be just 
above the spot you want for where the steam wand has to be when it's submerged. And as we know that if you have the steam wand above the actual milk, it's gonna splatter up in your face, like immediately. I also often show this with water when I'm teaching my students and I'll just show them immediately without telling them. I'll be like, if the steam wand's above, it's gonna psh, right in your face. Uh, gets a good laugh, light, lightens up the load a little bit of the class. <laughs> Uh, and then I show them the difference is if you submerge that steam tip too much, it's obviously going to scream at you. You're not going to inject any air. Uh, and, and when we think about injecting air into milk, we have to remember that the steam wand itself is not producing air. It's producing steam. So if you do have that steam tip completely submerged, you're not going to get any air. I always describe it kind of like when you do a, a cannonball and there's this kind of gap of air behind you in the pool that fills in, that's kind of what's happening with the steam wand. If it's in that exact spot, it's going to push the milk away and there will be air inside that area that will then get pulled into the milk. Uh, and due to the proteins and the science of milk, that stays in the milk. Uh, and the benefit of using small bubbles in the beginning is that, well, now you have small bubbles that we can just make smaller to a degree rather than having to work out these giant pockets of air that you've added. Uh, and ultimately, we also want to do this all at the very front of the steaming. So like another big tip I would tell people is always make sure you're getting the air in at the very beginning. Don't overthink it. Less is more. Keep it very simple. I like to tell them to just go slightly deeper than they need to be. And then as soon as that steam wand is turned to full max, they're just going to lightly, and I mean like a millimeter, bring down that pitcher until they hear that gentle, quintessential chirping sound of really well textured milk. The, okay, so the, the chirping sound, uh, there is, I suppose, um, some, um, I guess, there is, I suppose, some flexibility, depending on your machine, of how many chirps create the ideal amount of milk. What are the rules or guidelines for once you're there, do you just like, like keep chirping? Or like for a small you know, <laughs> cappuccino size, if you're using a 12 ounce pitcher, I imagine it's less than with a larger pitcher. So what are the rules that you have to apply in these different contexts of um, volume and pressure? Totally. So in the scenario, let's just say it's a bunch of drinks that are the exact same size, exact same texture to start with, right? We're gonna say, I'm working on a, maybe a Breville at home and then I'm working uh, with a maybe a PB linea or something like a really heavy duty machine, but I'm trying to get the same texture. Uh, in the case of the heavier machine, you have a much larger boiler, you have a much higher energy input and energy is gonna equal how much pressure you're able to build in that machine to a degree. Uh, and you also usually have a different kind of steam tip hole system. For instance, the Brevels are a lot more forgiving when you're injecting air. Uh, whereas something like a PB is you kind of got to get it as soon as you can because that milk is going to get super hot, super fast. Uh, typically, there's not an amount of injections I'm looking for. So for in the case of La Marzocco, the general rule is when the milk is warm to the touch, you can stop adding the air you need if you got it in there in the first place. Uh, and if you're working on something that strong, if you're using gentle injections, then you're going to get the amount of air you need within those few seconds at the very beginning. If you're working on something like a Breville, you have a little bit more time to focus on even tighter injections if you want, right? Because that general rule of the milk should be warm. You don't want to add any more air. Now, I'm not saying you need to go out and add a ton more air because you have more time, but you can really get those kind of finer bubbles in it. It's, it's if anything, more forgiving to do so. Uh, now, in the scenario that you're making different drinks, say you're making something like a 16-ounce latte, or maybe even a traditional cappuccino. This is where I would start to veer away from the traditional kind of rules of listen for the chirps. You still want to do chirps, but it's okay if they're just a little bit heavier than when you're trying to get something a little bit more precise and delicate. Um, I always just say generally the main rule is you want to do multiple injections of air rather than one big injection of air. You can always add more air if you really need to, but you can't really take away the work you've done if you just sabotage your milk in one big injection, right? Yeah, exactly. So this requires a lot of restraint and you have to know the context that you're operating in. Um, and the rule again that you mentioned is so critical that you can add more. Um, and 
also the rule that you should make this all happen within the beginning phases of the milk rather than later, mm -hmm. which means I guess you need to come to this with a mentality of, 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 you know, urgency and awareness that you're not just, uh, unconsciously putting a milk pitcher in the steam wand and then you'll draw your focus to it. You know, when you're good and ready, you just need to be ready to focus on it right away. Totally. Like immediately. And usually, I mean, I'm at the point I've been steaming milk for seven years now and, you know, very particular type of milk, especially for a competitive latte art, which takes a slightly thinner take on milk. Uh, but at this point, I can steam milk without looking. It's all through sound, and it's all through just having my hand in the right place. So I could walk up to a steam wand, I can put my pinky on that grill, have the pitcher in my hand, turn it on, and I can talk to someone without paying attention because I know the position to be in, and I know generally I'm just going to give a little bit of air until it's warm, and everything's going to work out because it always does when you're being gentle with your milk when you're injecting small bubbles that stay small versus big bubbles that you then have to kind of work out a little bit more in the post steaming process. So um, really, again, less is more. <laughs> if I can tell you anything today, it's that less is more. I like that you mentioned the difference between competitive latte art um, pouring styles and what we would even, I'm not talking about traditional as in like big fluffy milk, but just thicker volumes of well textured milk is what you would typically find in you know cafes now in the best cafes and then on the competitive stage there is a lot of really thin milk um because we're you know as a competitor you're going for a lot of uh, layers and precise lines and things like that um and I have a, a, a question, you know, following up this conversation about the different kinds of milks, but I want to um, get your take on when you're working as a barista you know, behind the bar and you kind of see the competitive latte art circuit and then you see the um, cafe's normal customers, it's awful tempting to, you know, kind of create what you see or even judge your success of what you're making based on what you see. But I mean, how do you balance knowing that there is a very specific type of competitive um, framework for milk foam versus what is typical in a coffee shop without getting too disappointed or, or torn between the two? That balance, uh, that balance I think is very critical. Uh, and I actually kind of see it a lot, especially when people are getting into latte art. A lot of the newer people in the scene will practice their latte art in a service environment uh, and I just don't think that, that that frame of reference that just because it's pretty doesn't mean it should be done has happened for some people yet. That's not anyone in particular. I'm just saying kind of broadly. Uh, but seeing people flex really intricate designs that you would normally see in a competition but in a cafe, it, it kind of hurts my heart a little bit because I know that those drinks are beautiful. They're made well. Uh, but they're missing that kind of, I think, quintessential creaminess that you get from just like two or three more injections of air. And usually when I'm on bar, which has been years from now, but I, I would typically just pour beautiful hearts. Or if I had to texture something a little heavier, like uh, maybe not a traditional cappuccino, but something a little more in between, modern and traditional, I'll use that Starbucks pitcher I use sometimes so I can really distribute the foam in my milk and use it as if it's thinner but it's actually not thinner. It's going to come back up in the cup and it's going to be very creamy and lovely. And I want to encourage people not to get discouraged because of this. Usually when I teach, one of the first things I say is, this is not how you're going to steam for every single person. This is for fun fun, for play play, <laughs> not for work work. That doesn't mean you can't have fun and flex a little bit on your downtime. I mean, do what your cafe lets you do, but it is for play play <laughs> at the end of the day. It's garnish, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you're, if you're a pastry chef, you're not giving people chocolate sculptures all day long. No, you're not. That's so funny. <laughs> so with that said, I think it's really critical for us to, you know, as baristas, I think the number one thing that you have to do is excel and be excellent with the tools and ingredients that you've been given to work with. Um, and when we're steaming milk, um, not necessarily talking about alternative milks at the moment or plant-based milks, but just the various, the various levels of fat in milk have a huge consequence on the kinds of techniques that you have to use as a barista to steam them well. 
And I wonder if you could give us your take on the varying levels of uh, degrees of fat in milk from, you know, skim and 2% and whole milk or <laughs> even, you know, God forbid, uh, heavy cream and uh, the like. Yeah, totally. Um, so my experience, and I think this is backed up true to science as well, uh, is skim milk, 2% milk is always going to be harder to get that texture that you want to serve to get those kind of creamy mouthfeel. With that being said, 2% milk and skim milk are much better foaming agents. When you think about them uh, chemically, they are even, sorry, when you think about them with the proteins that they have and how they're able to hold on to all that air, but they don't have any fat to displace that air because fat is a natural destabilizer of foam, which I, it actually works in a positive way. The more fat you have, the more creamy your mouth feel, but the less thick your foam is gonna be. Uh, so when I say that 2% and skim milk foam better, I don't mean that they foam better in terms of foam you want to use, but I mean they foam better in terms of if you were to analyze foam, they are a stiffer, more consistent foam. Uh, it's kind of like when you're making a meringue, uh, you don't want any of the egg whites to have any fat in them because you want your egg whites to stiffen up, right? That's what happens in a meringue. Uh, and, but, in, but if you accidentally added a little bit of egg yolk, well, then it's actually not going to make that stiff foam. You're going to get something that's kind of a little bit in between without those peaks. This is somewhat true for whole milk as well. You're always going to get a nicer, creamier texture with whole milk uh, to a point. If you keep adding more fat, like let's say you're going heavy whipping cream, I very much promise you, you're going to hear one, your steam one's going to scream at you, and two, you're going to have to work pretty hard to get that to be as foamy or at least as creamy as your normal milk, whole milk uh, counterpart. You say work hard. What do you mean uh, by work hard? What is it you're doing to... I uh, achieve foam in heavier fat milks? Totally. Uh, I mean, with starting with skim milk, because it's such a better foaming agent, you would want to inject less air than you normally would. You can be a little bit gentler with it, and then you just want to work on that vortex a little bit more. As you get deeper into heavier fat milks, you just have to be a bit more diligent with those air injections. I, I feel free to make them a tiny bit bigger. Don't go and obliterate your air or your milk, don't go obliterate your milk with a bunch of big injections, but you have a little bit more freedom to try to work that air in. It's just, again, you have until that pitcher gets warm to the touch to do it. And because there's so much fat content, you have to start off exactly in the right spot. Uh, as I've been steaming milk for the last seven years, over time, I now can turn on a steam wand without looking and I'll be exactly in the right spot. And this is important because it saves me time to get those air injections in before the milk gets warm. Typically what people do is they'll submerge the steam tip and they'll bring it down until they find that part where the chirps are happening. But if you get really good, you get really skilled in a scenario like something with heavy cream, it's in your best interest to pay attention to where that area of lot, it's in your best interest to pay attention to where that line is. Basically that's this imaginary line of how deep that steam tip should be submerged to where when you turn it on, you're automatically hearing very gentle chirps. Right? Like if you get good at being right in the right place at the right time, it won't be so hard, but that's in itself pretty challenging, especially if you're starting off as a beginner. Right, yeah, well said. And so the precision is always key here, knowing what you're working with, uh, being exact in your positioning and adding more steam or, or more chirps and, and such in the beginning than with heavier fat milks than you would with lower fat milks. And then, the the resulting product, as you say, is going to be a stiffer foam with skim as it would be with whole milk than it would be with whole milk. And so uh, what do you suggest we do to kind of manage our expectations as customers are going to choose a milk that we don't necessarily like to work with because it doesn't let us show off as much or... You know, I know my latte art is never um, super awesome with skim uh, as as a, a same thing with um, heavy cream or, or half and half sometimes. But but why is that? What in the terms of uh, visuals of the drink and how the milk flows out of the pitcher and into the cup, what are we looking at dif difference wise between the various fat levels? Totally. Uh, the way that I see it, I guess to go back to that first point is the way that I treat milk for anybody who's coming into the cafe as a guest is the same way that I treat decaf coffee. 
You know, just because someone's using a milk that I may not love to steam with doesn't mean I'm not going to give any more attention or love to that actual drink. I'm going to try to treat it as much as I normally do for my favorite milks. I might internally roll my eyes a little bit, but I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to make people's day a little bit better. So in the case of 2% milk, low-fat milk, I would again inject a little less and I would groom the milk a little bit more so that it has a smoother overall texture. But I would keep it simple. I would pour something like a classic heart, uh, maybe a ripple heart. I wouldn't go crazy. And also you're in the middle of service, so there's no reason to go crazy with how much you're actually doing in your pours. Uh, you're busy. You got to keep it moving. And then with heavy whipping cream or anything like that, or like half and half, typically what you're going to see is a more flat drink. Uh, there's more destabilizing happening to that foam. This is not always true. This is an umbrella statement. Uh, but you typically see a much wider white for the actual design, but a thinner texture overall. Uh, so for those drinks, I take them very slow, very delicate. Often I will do the same. I will just pour a simple heart or something to those effects and save the fun stuff for after hours with normal milk. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, my last question to you here, and this has been enormously helpful, um, and I would encourage anybody to, you know, wants to dive in further to all of this to subscribe to your channels. And you've got an enormous amount of uh, content around this. It goes into greater detail. But um, when we're talking about personally being responsible for our own progress as baristas um, in learning how to steam milk, I'm, I'm curious how you would um, advise aspiring baristas to, to just practice well and make good progress. Follow up to that would be for people who are trainers and leaders who can help set up the um, environment for learning well, what would your suggestion be to them to help their baristas succeed in um, steaming milk well for all their beverages? I think I'll start with the second, setting up the expectation that there shouldn't be any fear. And if there is fear, it's okay because we're just here steaming some milk. At the end of the day, we're going to close the machine. We're going to come back the next day, we're going to steam some more milk. So it's really, really chill. I think setting up that expectation that you're in a safe place, we're here to help you, is very important for any educator, for any single coffee topic, especially because the last thing we need, honestly, in coffee is any more pretentious educators, if I'm being really honest. Um, so as a trainer, it's your job to make people feel comfortable in your space uh, and approach them with a lot of positive feedback. I always compliment sandwich. So I'll be like, that was really good. Uh, this is where you could, you know, do a little better. So next time, let's do it right now. Let's not even change the subject. Let's fix that thing. Uh, and then right here, you could also tweak that a little bit. So compliment sandwich is very good. The last thing you want someone to feel is that they just are utterly making mistakes. Uh, and milk can be taught so easily. Literally, if you wanted to do the Dritan style and grab a bunch of plates and put the pitcher on the side and angle that steam wand and turn it on at the very right spot, you could steam milk that way. You totally can. The whole thing is giving people the empowerment to understand that less is more and that you totally got this. Now, if I was a starting out again, or if I'm, if I'm able to give any advice to any beginner baristas out there, uh, you can do things like practicing with that drop of soap. Those are always great techniques to get more consistency. Uh, milk in itself is not technically a renewable resource, but you know, those cows make more than a gallon of milk every once in a while. So sometimes it's okay <laughs> to get a gallon of milk and to practice your craft. I'm not a big fan of waste. I try to advocate against it. There's also a bunch of really cool products out there that are kind of emulate the effects of milk. Uh, but truly at the end of the day, hands-on experience is gonna be your best tool uh, paying attention to the sound, like I was saying earlier, you don't even have to look at the milk when you get really good. It's all about the sound. Uh, and texture is something that you'll get better and better and better at the more you do it. Ask for feedback from people around you uh, and taste the drinks yourself. Always aim for something that is not super thin and not so thick that uh, you, <laughs> you can feel the bubbles in your mouth. Nice. Yeah, eventually you get to be one with the milk, right? You are one. The milk is you. The force of the flow is within you. I mean, it, honestly, it kind of comes down to like the technique, really, truly, and simply is, I can say it right now, I let money use my rhymes, but you give it a spray into the tray, you pull the steam wand out, you marry it to the spout, another little rhyme here for you, you submerge that steam tip in the middle, we're not going to steam in the middle, you're going to tilt the pitcher just over a little bit, right? So it starts, start in the middle, tilt it just a little, but don't touch the wall mm -hmm. because that spot's going to get too hot and we won't understand what's going on with our hands. And then once you're in the to that, and then once you're to that side, 
near the middle, right? And if we were looking straight down, I'm talking like a bullseye, you're still on that middle line. There's an invisible line through that bullseye, but your picture is slightly tilted and it doesn't matter which direction. Then you're going to submerge that steam tip uh, to, then you're gonna submerge that steam tip to where it is about a half an inch below the surface. And I always say, this is very important, that if that's too much and you turn that steam wand on and it obliterates your milk, well, Goldilocks rules. Now you know next time to submerge a little deeper. Honestly, if I had it my way, Chris, I would make a steam wand tip that had notches in it so you could literally know which notch is associated with which textured drink, right? So like a bunch of notches up would be a much thinner drink than if you had more of that steam wand exposed. But now I'm rambling about a product I haven't invented. Um, and then you just add air until it gets warm to the touch and then you submerge the steam tip and let it get hot to the touch, but not too hot. Uh, and then you're done, but don't forget to clean. And honestly, it's that simple. And if you're on a commercial machine, it happens in like less than 20 seconds. Um, which is which is the challenge. It's it's just becoming aware of the length of time that you have to work with in the simplicity of the steps <laughs> under pressure. Um, but I, I think with your instruction and breaking this down and definitely giving us permission to take it a little bit at a time, less is more, like you're saying, and and just give yourself grace in the process of of uh, creating these uh, textures and these in milk is a huge uh, piece of advice that I can't reiterate enough because we do kind of get down on ourselves. <laughs> There's so much to compare yourself against now in the industry. I used to be very excited about things that today I, I'd be like, <laughs> I don't know why I was excited about that. Um, if I had Instagram back in the day, I, I probably would have not had as much joy and so today it feels like maybe we, we do need to put focus on generating more joy, less comparison and more grace in the process. I totally agree. It's really easy to compare yourself online to other people, especially on things like Instagram, which is probably the most prolific version of latte art being visually displayed. I think Instagram is like the powerhouse of where you see that. And it's very easy to see something from someone who's like a champion. And then you're like, why doesn't my milk look like that? I'll never be able to do it. Something I see in my comments all the time is, nope, not for me. I'm not able to do it. And I, I can't handle that comment because you absolutely can do it. You absolutely can learn. Anyone can learn. Uh, it's just less is more. And you got to be taught the right way. And just pay attention. Just like you're saying, give yourself some grace. And remember, because no one mentions this, the things that you see on Instagram it, just like any influencers on Instagram, are altered, right? You're not going to be serving that in a cafe environment. So just take it slow. Enjoy the coffee. Don't compare yourself. And maybe watch one of my videos <laughs> if you can. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that. How do you want us to stay in contact with you? How do we go and follow you, subscribe to your channels, and learn more from your experiences? Oh yeah, if you wanna follow me, you can follow me directly on Instagram. Uh, that is where I post a lot of really short format tutorial content and also some fun, playful content here and there. If you wanted longer format and you wanted to sit down and really digest it, you can go over to my YouTube. Uh, it's just my name, Emily Bryant. Uh, my Instagram is Instagram, E-M-S-T-A-G-R-I-M, -E like the Grim Reaper. Uh, and both of those, I th honestly, I've been putting in a lot of different tutorials for milk. I'm also going to do a YouTube one soon that is Milk Revisited because I feel like my last video was a little too much on the science. And a lot of people don't want to hear the science. They just want to get right in. So we're going to revisit that pretty soon. So definitely make sure to get in there. I'm also on TikTok. Same thing. Uh, Instagram on TikTok. But I don't post there as much yet. Uh, but, you know, I'd always appreciate a follow from you guys. If you ever want to contact me, best place to do it is Instagram. Uh, but there's no guarantee <laughs> that I'll be able to see it. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's uh, I really encourage everyone to follow you. You do great work and we're really thankful for you being on the show today. Thanks, Emily. Oh my gosh. No, thank you. I, I hope that maybe I added a little value to someone's day today. Okay, everyone. Well, I hope that you got a lot from these conversations about milk science and milk texturing and steaming. 
one of the things that I think you could just kind of uh, pull from both of these together, uh, from both Morton and Emily, is that we want to make things as simple on ourselves as possible. And but that requires that we observe deeply what is actually happening and then apply that to our coffee bars. In doing so, we'll allow you to see the benefit of that knowledge because you'll have a consistency, you'll have understanding, and you'll have better products in the end. And I would encourage you to go ahead and look up uh, coffee-mind.com to learn more about what Morton is doing and also to go visit Emily's YouTube channel, which I will link to in the show notes here that has a lot of helpful tips uh, that you can dive into even deeper when it comes to milk steaming and beyond. So a big thank you to Morton and Emily for joining me on the show. I really appreciate both of you. And if you all have any comments, questions, or feedback about today's episode, of course, you can reach out to me, chris at keys to the shop.com. And you can also use that email to uh, set up a free discovery call to talk about working with keys to the shop consulting working one-on-one -on -one with me to build a great coffee business and improve your coffee business. Uh, that is chris at keys to the shop.com. And of course, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, Emily is a uh, Coffee Fest World Latte Art Champion. And I want to talk to you about Coffee Fest because Coffee Fest is absolutely, I think, the best place to go as a coffee retailer to learn, be inspired, educated, and resourced to run a great coffee business. If you're going to go to any event, I think you really need to go to a Coffee Fest trade show because they have free or excessively priced trainings, workshops, panel discussions, and lectures to help equip you for success. We've also got, of course, the Latte Art Competition, Cold Brew Competition. You've got the show floor where you can interact with all vendors that have great products for your cafe, and you get to be around great coffee people at the same time. So go to coffeefest.com to learn more about upcoming shows in 2023, starting in New York and then in Louisville, Kentucky, actually my hometown. And then beyond, you just go to coffeefest.com to find out more about those shows and sign yourself and your team up for them. Again, that's over at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Follow Keys to the Shop on Instagram at Keys to the Shop. And I hope you have an amazing day. And of course, as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.